next point is this, which is that one of the difficulties you have with science is the sheer number of entities. And as a result, science has acquired its own reserve vocabulary, okay, uh, in that sense. The words that are on this slide, when it does appear, are words like, there we are, words like photosynthesis, meiosis, mitosis, things like that. Now, the, 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 the trouble for the teacher of science is that there is this large vocabulary it's pointed to on this slide, okay, and those words have to be introduced. Okay, now those words, okay, in some senses are, it, it, as, a, as, a, as a student of science, you know this word's unfamiliar, you know it's got a specific meaning, and therefore there is something to be learnt, yeah. and something to be learnt how to spell, as everyone always know. In my youth I used to struggle with phenol, phenol phthalate, uh, endlessly, okay, uh, I think finally I now do know how to spell it. But the question you might ask yourself, and I think this is another point about scientific language, is why does science need such a particular vocabulary? Uh, and the answer to that is that scientific language has evolved. It is not the same as the language that Darwin used uh, 100 or 200 years ago. There is an ever uh, expanding range of concepts in that kind of way. And it is, it's evolved because there are more and more complex ideas to communicate and therefore we invent new terms all the time. Nanotechnology, for instance, being a very good example of a term which did not exist, say, 30 or 40 years ago. And associated with them are whole new sets of concepts. Those of you engaged in biology, obviously, in the past 50, 60 years, the notions of RNA, DNA, and all the concepts that go with them. Now, you cannot avoid that. Okay? As a teacher of science, you have to introduce students to that particular terminology. And as is said in this particular study, uh, in a study of high school physics texts, uh, this is a student study in, between, in Germany between age 14 and 16, there were over 2,000 new technical terms that were introduced. And effectively what that meant is that there were eight new words a lesson and the person doing this study estimated that that was more than there was in a foreign language lesson. And I think it does put science in some kind of perspective and your role. And it says that actually if you don't pay attention to these words, students will not acquire them by some kind of process of simple osmosis. But it's not just the words. Okay. Science, okay, as I said, has evolved as a language and it uses these kinds of things as well. Diagrams. Okay? Most of you are going to recognize this diagram straight off. It's a cross-section of the heart. It hasn't got anything labeled on it, uh, and it's fairly clear. But you recognize that diagram because you were taught how to recognize it, because you were shown it, and because it was illustrated to you. And this is increasingly true of science, which is there's a lot of diagrammatic representation, particularly, I think, in areas like biology, where you have to be shown what it is that is actually being represented. And the difficulty in biology quite often is there's the diagram on the one hand and the organism on the other hand, which you can't see into unless you're prepared to cut it up, which gets in, you know, raises et ethical issues, um, which I'm not going to go into here. Okay? Um, then there are these kinds of things. There are charts, okay, which increasingly, because of computers, are, are complex uh, uh, or, or in that sense, and you have to learn how to interpret them, or there are structures or models, okay, like the one on the right, the famous one, the DNA one, uh, which, for those of you with an interest in history of science, is actually in the Science Museum in London. Uh, that is the first model of DNA ever built. For some strange reason, they don't celebrate it. You have to go and find it, but it is there uh, for those of you with an interest in biology. You're also confronted by charts, okay, and many of um, graphs. As many of you know, um, any teacher of science will tell you, getting students to actually uh, uh, just actually produce a graph, let alone interpret graph, is often quite a struggle. And you go through that kind of frustrating process of actually asking yourself, well, didn't they do this in maths? Okay? And the answer is no. Okay? <laughs> Not the way you wanted it done. Okay? Okay? And therefore it comes back to you having to do it. Uh, there are these kinds of things, pie charts. Okay? How do we construct them? Made somewhat easier, obviously, by information technology, but just because it makes it easier doesn't mean that you understand it anymore. Anybody like myself who works as a researcher, there are wonderful programs these days that do all kinds of statistics, but if you don't understand what it's doing, it really is, is, is a waste of time. So the fundamental teaching of what these represent, how they come to represent it, uh, is really quite important uh, for you as a teacher of science. 
Uh, and then, of course, ultimately, there is the dreaded mathematics. Okay? Uh, I picked here a particularly complex version of it, okay? but it doesn't really matter what level you're working at. It tends to produce this kind of sheer horror okay? uh, uh, as to what do those strange symbols mean and what on earth is being expressed by that kind of relationship. And you can't avoid, I'm afraid, teaching it. One of the challenges, I think, for the teacher of science is the way in which you talk about it may be different from the way in which the uh, uh, mathematics teachers talk about it. And there is a kind of value in communicating with them as to how they talk about it, so that it doesn't look quite so different. One of the great joys, I think, about teaching mathematics and science is that finally some of the mathematics make sense to the kids. Okay? Because it's all been abstract, decontextualized stuff, and you give it some kind of meaning. So the problem with science is not the language of science, but the languages, the plural one, okay, in the sense that science uses all of these things, words, okay, okay, and often in unfamiliar and special ways, and I'll look at a little bit of that in a moment. They use diagrams, charts and graphs, symbols and mathematics, and they use those in order to construct meaning. And the phrase used for this these days is multimodal or multisemiotic. And increasingly, you will see that all forms of communication have gone that particular way. Uh, uh, even uh, presenters like myself, in fact, uh, uh, and other people, are forced into using pictures because we know that those things communicate things which words don't do so well. And you look at your textbooks. Your textbook that you look at now, I don't know whether you're like me, but for some perverse reason I still got my physics textbook when I did physics at level. You compare that textbook with a modern textbook, and they are totally different things. And they're different in this kind of way. Here's a piece of text from a textbook which I took off the internet. Uh, if you read it, you will see it's a very simple piece of text about converting uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius uh, temperature scales. Uh, it's got a picture, uh, and in, underneath it, it explains, uh, as you can see, what the various things mean. Uh, and then there's a little bit of mathematics about how to turn it from what, uh, uh, one temperature Celsius into another. Uh, unfortunately, we're still lumbered with the need to do this. I'm not sure whether you still have to teach it, but that's the, the relevant point. Now, hey, look, what does that text look like if you take the picture out? Okay. All of a sudden, it, it, it's not incomprehensible, but it becomes less meaningful. Okay. The teacher, the, it's not that the illustration is something which is supplementary, a nice picture, an adjunct, which is the way in which pictures were used in the textbooks of the 1950s and 1960s, if they had pictures, okay, in that sense, it's essential. It becomes, and also what happens, okay, if you start to take out other things like the symbols and you start to take out the mathematics, okay, uh, it becomes essentially uh, uh, meaningless. And the point here is that science doesn't speak the world uh, in the, the language of words alone. It speaks in terms of symbols, diagrams, and charts, and increasingly so. Uh, and that therefore, okay, the act of constructing meaning from that has become more complex. Now that's one of the issues I think that you're confronted with. 